welcome to Authenticity Unleashed. I'm your host, Pam Rader, and I'm here today with Teresa Lear Levine, who is quite an incredible lady. She is the author of a book called Becoming More Me. She is the host of the podcast, Becoming More Me. And she is an EFT or emotional freedom technique practitioner and proudly um, uh, an ADHD entrepreneur. <laughs> and um, I am so happy and grateful to have you here this morning, Teresa. Thank you for joining oh, thank me. You, Pam. I'm so excited to be here and just delighted to have crossed paths with you and be in each other's worlds. The same. So for people who uh, don't know anything about you, tell me a little bit about what led you to become uh, an entrepreneur in such a, a special niche of, of tea and, and feel free to explain a little bit about what that is. But how did you go from pretty regular kind of life to, uh, <laughs> to following the untread path, if you will? Yeah. Thank you. It's fun to get to talk about these things. I think that the entrepreneurial bug was always part of my makeup, but I wasn't really sure how to make it what it is now. When when I was a kid, I remember making jewelry and my mom has been a potter for as long well, before I was alive. So she was always doing like pottery craft shows and things. And I would take my little like handmade jewelry along and try to sell it at the craft shows with her. Um, I remember creating a library with my friends and we always were writing books. And then I ended up writing a book. There's so many things that happened early in life that really kind of foreshadowed what would happen later. I used to love writing songs and lyrics. And now as a hypnotherapist, I feel like the transformations that I write and create for my clients are like songs. It's just all happening in a different way. But I grew up thinking I was just going to probably get a job and, you know, do whatever. I worked in credit card banking for a while until I had a couple of car accidents that put me in disability. And then from that place, I was kind of energetically depleted. I felt like everything that I thought my life was going to be about wasn't quite working out the way I thought. And I didn't have the same kind of relationship with the universe or source then that mm -hmm. I do now. Um, it was a little different and ended up marrying, um, not necessarily for the right reasons or the right person, had my first of four sons with uh, my first husband. And then by the time he was one year old, we were already, you know, heading for divorce. And I was just in this energetically low place. Now, throughout that, I, I made candles. I sold candles. I made bath and body products. I sold those. I always had something that I was trying to create or sell or bring into the world in that way that an entrepreneur does. But it wasn't until about eight years ago. I mean, fast forward through the divorce. I'm now married, coming up on 16 years to my husband, Jeff. We had three more boys together mm -hmm. and things are much different. But about eight years ago, right after having my uh, my youngest son, um, who's seven now, I was at a retreat. At the time, I was doing more physical fitness coaching, nutrition coaching, that kind of thing. And there was an EFT practitioner that presented to us at the retreat. And it was amazing to me what happened just in group doing a little bit of tapping on the body and talking about things and how much different it was than just talking about things and how much more embodied I felt and how, yeah, we were working on anxiety as a group and yet so much more than anxiety was clearing in me doing yeah. just very vague and unfocused kind of work because it was group. It wasn't specific to me and my particular anxieties or what have you. And I was just really intrigued by it. And I think the ADHD part of me, the impatient part of me always likes quick fixes, always likes things that, you know, sound too good to be true. And for me, some of these modalities that I have embraced have felt that way to me, like, wow, 
can this really work this well? And then it does. And it just like knocks my socks off every time. I have to tell you something funny about that. I thought, I mean, I'm, I've been a yoga teacher for 25 years. I I'm all about the woo woo, but then there's some things that come along and I'm like, really, that's too good to be true. And EFT was one of them. And then a few years ago, I saw Tony Robbins doing it. And I was like, that's gotta be legit. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, if Tony's doing it, if Tony's doing it, it's legit. <laughs> it's amazing how many celebrities do it. And I know when I first started studying and looking at it and seeing the Olympians and the NFL players on the sideline, it's like, once you know what you're looking for and you can identify someone doing it, you'll see people doing it in all different places. So just, just so that if somebody's listening and they don't have a clue what that, what it is that we're talking about, just to give a brief overview of what EFT is. Sure. It's emotional freedom techniques, and it's been around since the 90s in the way that we use it now. And it stems from things that have been around for thousands of years, like ancient Chinese medicine mm-hmm. and traditional talk therapy. But it puts them together in this way that we end up using our fingertips to tap meridian endpoints in the body, same places that if you went to an acupuncturist, they might poke with a, a needle to release the um, the energetic um, blockages. But we all we have to do is tap with our fingertips and basically talk about the issue. I love that we get to focus on the negative. We live in a world where everybody wants us to just feel better, get positive, what have you. But the negative stuff really does need a voice in order for those emotions to move up and out like they want to. So we get to give the issues a voice and move that energy and In doing that, we also go directly, we send signals directly to the amygdala, the part of the brain that's in charge of the fight, flight, flee, flop, fawn, all that, and get to calm that. So we get to lower our stress hormones very quickly. And a new perspective emerges very fast when we do this. So usually like five minutes or less, you can lower your cortisol by 43% and really start showing up differently uh, in the different situations in your life where maybe you're experiencing resistance or frustration or bothersome memories or what have you. So you can literally use it on anything. I, I really love all the things that you just said, because I've been teaching, as I said, yoga for 25 years, but I also train teachers and I've studied not just the yogic texts, but many of the ancient spiritual texts. And Mm -hmm. this is completely in alignment with the, the simple universal truth that what you resist persists and what you embrace dissolves and, yeah. you know, to seek the truth. And and the truth is that we shove anxiety down and put a smile on our face in this toxic positivity society. We, um, we think that if we have anxious feelings, that there's something wrong with us. And so we hide them. And then we wonder why it gets, you know, it, it is, it expands within us. Emotions like everything want to come through us. The spiritual teaching around that is that the whole is the goal, that we are here to experience the totality of the emotional roller coaster of life. And oh, yeah. I think that it's been lost on us in the past decades as to how do I experience those things? What are the tools for for me to be able to expand my capacity for discomfort, to to be able to sit with and allow these emotions to come through me? And I think it's so beautiful that EFT is a, it's a tool to teach us impatient, imperfect people who think that we have to hide everything to say, okay, first of all, it's okay to feel this. Second of all, I'm going to invite it up and I've got a pathway for it to not be a permanent state. Because I think that's the big thing. We're afraid to feel anxiety because we think it might be permanent. Yes. (laughs) So EFT allows us a pathway to move something through us. And the meridian points, like that's traditional Chinese medicine. Sure is. But you can look in, you know, you can look at that in Taoism and and that comes through in yin yoga. Yep. Working with the meridian points. Um, but even in the Indian yoga teachings, they call them marma points, same mm-hmm. thing. And so this has been like 5,000 years of ancient yes. study. So people that think this is new or woo-woo, it's not. It's just no, it's all wisdom. scientifically proven. <laughs> and yeah, it's stuff that people have been using in different ways for a very long time. This yeah. is just a way that it was put together by Gary Craig in the 90s mm-hmm. that he recognized that with these, basically the nine points that are most often used for EFT, we can energetically overhaul anything. Yeah. Crazy. Okay. So 
<clears throat> you had a car accident or two, you said? Yeah. And you were put into disability. Tell me about that. That that seems like a moment where the universe goes, you're going in the wrong direction. Stop. Mm -hmm. You haven't been listening to me. Was it like that for you? Yeah, it was really difficult because the cars were not, I mean, it was probably like a thousand dollars damage to the cars each time. It didn't seem like a huge car accident, but I ended up, I still have vertigo from time to time from it. Um, herniated discs, uh, just nausea, migraines, all sorts of different things happening. And it didn't feel like anybody was able to help me feel better. And I didn't have the same connection, like I said, both to, to source and also to understanding holistic healing mm -hmm. then at, I think I was 19. 20, the first accident. So I was pretty young. I was just getting out on my own, just had my first like full-time job. I was still in college, really just felt like the world was at my fingertips and I was just getting started. And then I can hardly get out of bed and I feel cruddy all the time. And yeah. And I think there was also part of me that was like, I don't even really want this whole nine to five, one or two week of vacation a year life anyway. And what on earth do I do even when I do feel better? Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, you talk, you talk about being connected to source. I, I don't know what the experience has been like for you, but I know that when I've felt disconnected from source at times and gone down pathways that were not aligned for me, I've had some taps on the shoulder from the universe, from source. And I typically have chosen not to listen until I get the two by four in the head. Sure. <laughs> and it usually comes in the form of some kind of catastrophe that forces me to look inward. So you questioned yourself, do I even want this nine to five? And mm. you, qu you, you have a one-year-old child? Not at that time. I, I didn't get married until a bit later, but it was, you know, I, I met my first husband while I was feeling that energetic depletion of going so through. So you attracted that energy into your life. Exactly. Got it. And I can totally own that. And we, we made the best of it that we could given the yeah. circumstances, but it wasn't, it wasn't meant to be to the point where I knew even, you know, the night before we were to get married and my mom had even said to me, like, you don't have to do this. Like, it's okay. Mm -hmm. But the people pleaser in me was not willing to say no. It's like people flew in from all over the place. We, you know, we, we got married right after nine 11. Um, it was the same week. And, uh, yeah, I just felt like everything just felt heavy and just, deep and dark and not right at that time. So it was kind of hard to separate like, what is the feeling of the world right now? And what is the feeling of me in this relationship right now? Yeah, I can relate to, to that. I remember walking down the aisle of being married to my first husband, who I also was married to for just, um, I think two years total, but, um, and we had one son together. I also have four sons, so we have a lot in common. <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, I remember thinking, I shouldn't do this. And my parents spent this much money and all these people flew in and went against everything that my inner knowing mm -hmm. was telling me. Yeah. And um, I think there's a huge cost. I mean, that there's an obvious cost there when we're talking about getting married. That's a big deal. But how much do you think this sort of buy into societal values and, and, and our, our parents' values and our grandparents and the, with, without consulting our inner knowing, how much do you think that's contributing to what I would refer to as kind of a, like the human condition and like a, a sickness of the soul really in our society? There's a lot of it that contributes to that for sure. I mean, just I, I just think of the the chakra blockages and things that I must have been experiencing at that time, the way things had to have not been flowing freely. Uh, even for, you know, the person who I cared about the most, my mom telling me, you know, it was okay and me still being like, no, you know, like people bought me like gifts for the shower and what am I gonna do? Like what it just I was comparing apples to oranges and definitely was not in alignment in myself, in integrity in myself. And yeah, it was, nothing was really happening for the right reasons. 
and I could feel that misalignment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or were you always this sort of a sensitive soul that way? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I see it a lot right now in my youngest son, too. I was always the kind that, like, I I could never watch, like, the scary movies or, like, the really difficult, like, violent stuff Mm -hmm. or whatever else that always just majorly kind of, like, triggered me. I'm very uh, empathetic and I can really read people's energy very well. And that's also really common um, in alignment with ADHD also. Um, for anybody who's listening that has ADHD that also feels that way, it's really, it's a common trait. And also I think it's a superpower. I'm glad that I have that. If I didn't, I wouldn't be so good at helping other people because I wouldn't be able to understand and, you know, empathize and kind of put myself in their shoes and feel their energy as well to be able to help them move through. Yeah. It's really interesting. This it's kind of a double-edged sword. You know, there is a, a, a term called HSP, which you've probably heard of, which is highly sensitive people. And, and sometimes that crisscrosses with ADHD and sometimes it's its own thing, but basically that some people, People are just wired to be more sensitive to their environment and people around them. But then there's another section of, of sort of the, the population. And I'm, I'm going to guess that this is a lot of the people that you get to, to help and, and me as well that had to learn to read the room <laughs> to stay safe in their life. Yeah. You know, growing up in chaotic environments or where there was yelling or violence or even just energetic violence in terms of parents that withdraw love. And so at a very young age, children often learn to read the room and they can read people's faces and emotions and they adapt themselves to please that person to avoid rejection and um, punishment of of sort and to win love. And I think that to some degree, most of us go through some of that. I can definitely relate to it. And then when we get to a point and maybe it's a car accident or maybe it's a a marriage that's misaligned or something that's so misaligned that our soul says, I can't anymore. Then we are blessed with the gift of a challenge and we can either keep going down the same path or choose to embrace something new. So you, you're in this marriage. What, what made you decide to get out and what exactly led you to I mean, I know you said you were doing EFT at this, at this retreat, but you were at a retreat. I want to know about what led you down that path. You said you weren't that connected to source. What was the change for you that was like, I don't want to do life like this. And I want to go find who I am and, and become more me. The title yes. of your, your stuff. There's so many things <laughs> to say about everything that you just said, going back to like when we're growing up and that feeling that essentially it's the feeling that you're not safe to be yourself. And then Mm -hmm. you adapt in those different ways. And then that's definitely the same sort of thing that was triggered when I was both going through the car accident recovery and also getting married for the first time, that it wasn't actually safe to really step into these things as myself. Mm -hmm. Um, people might not understand. I had gone through some things like with my father, not understanding me being out of work. Cause you know, my, none of my injuries showed up on my face. It wasn't like, or broken bones or anything else. It was all like my brain and my muscles and my body. And yeah, it was nothing people could see. So I look like a healthy functional 20 year old and I'm not, Mm -hmm. and it didn't feel safe. So going through that, getting married, not feeling safe to really express the authenticity of who I was, and then leading up to exiting the marriage, just things things were just not kind. I didn't feel like it was the right place to be raising our son. Um, and everything felt so misaligned that it was kind of like I knew I was never going to get to fulfill my dreams, raise my son the way I wanted to, or really have the life I wanted if I stayed. Mm -hmm. And it was also, it was kind of like the car accident. It's like from the outside, marriage looks okay. You know, we're, we're doing all the normal things, having the normal struggles and issues and everything else and, and some not normal ones, but, um, yeah. So it was, it was difficult to justify it to other people that 
it wasn't, it didn't feel worth me staying. Isn't it? You know, I want to just ask you this and I, I don't know this about you or I don't, but for me, when I was about to leave in my second marriage, I couldn't really find a reason that was like, you know, I, I actually found myself, I said, I wish he would cheat on me. I wish he would like take a swing at me. Cause then I'd have a reason. It's mm -hmm. so, it's so fucked up, but I couldn't just honor the fact that I'm allowed to be happy and I'm allowed to recognize that there's a misalignment for me and to own that and to step into my power. Yeah. Would you say that was kind of what kept you there too for a while? That Yes and no. I had my reasons. Mm -hmm. There there was different types of abuse going on and things like mm -hmm. that. I definitely had my reasons. Um, I just didn't feel the strength to leave, to support myself, to take those next steps. Mm -hmm. So that was the part that I had to figure out. So mm -hmm. I ended up having to, I mean, move back in with my mom and things like that. It just felt like a total hit to the ego, you know, after right. moving out and, you know, buying my first house, buying our second house, all those, like the natural progression of life and marriage and family and all of that. And then it's like, I'm moving back into the spare room and my mom's house. Of course I failed. Yeah. And we make it mean something about us at a yep. deep level. Like I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. I'm not lovable. Something's wrong with me. I'm defective. Yes. Okay. So from there, you move in with mom, you've got a one-year-old child. Tell me about how, how you wind up at, at a retreat, how you, how you move into the path that you're in now as an author, a hypnotherapist. I'm interested in that. Um, and, and celebrating ADHD. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm blessed to have a very supportive family. So I was able to move in with my mom, my sister, you know, needed help from time to time taking care of like babysitting her kids and things. So mm -hmm. kind of got hired in by the family to help out with things, had, you know, different, different things that were definitely working for me at the time and also allowing me time to just like let loose, heal, just to figure my shit out. Mm -hmm. And I had no intentions of getting into any kind of relationship anytime soon. And of course, that's when they happen, right? Mm -hmm. So it was my ex and I were like newly separated. And I was out for like first girls night to just hang out and let loose um, in the beach town where my mom lives. And I meet Jeff, my now husband. And I, I literally told him the first night we met, I said, I've got a one-year-old. You don't want anything to do with me. You should probably go talk to somebody else. And he thankfully did not listen. So uh, definitely he had a major role on helping me through it. I mean, we literally went through my divorce together. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. um, the papers had like just been filed when we met. So we went through that whole process together, all the stuff with custody and visitation and all of those things. And um yeah, he was he was huge. He's always been very encouraging. I um I was able to go back to college and finish my degree that I had to stop when I had the car accident when I was younger. Um mm -hmm. and he just always believed in me. So having his belief in me, my mom's belief in me, everything else, it just it felt like things were going to work out. And I got into the health and fitness coaching after my well, gosh, he's 11 today. It's my son's 11th birthday today. And it was when he was a, a year old, about 10 years ago, I mm -hmm. started to coach in that way. And I loved it. And it got me back in shape. It helped me to better understand nutrition, which I'd gone to school for. I'd gone to school for nutrition and dietetics and psychology. And so they were all things that I was passionate about and interested in. And it gave me something to call my own again, mm -hmm. um, after feeling like I hadn't really had anything to call my own for a while and mm -hmm. really brought me back to myself and gave me goals and ambition again. And that was how I ended up at, at that retreat a few years after that and uh, with other health, fitness, nutrition coaches. So, mm -hmm. and just, you know, so you say you, you had something of your own. There was two things that I want to explore there. Number one, in becoming more of ourselves, sometimes I see a lot of people feel the need. They, there's this big, you know, movement towards boundaries in our society now. And I think that yes, boundaries are wonderful, but people misuse them yes. in terms of, I will use them to push everyone away from me to keep me safe from having to do any internal work on myself because everyone else is toxic except for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, instead of how do I keep peace in, but they also in doing so 
sometimes negate the beautiful support. And our parents aren't perfect. Our families aren't perfect, but we do need people around us to love us right. until we're strong enough to love ourselves. We need people, we need encouragers, people to embolden courage within us, people who believe in us and see us when we can't see our own potential. So yeah. that's like, I think, uh, an essential ingredient and it doesn't have to be family. It could be good friends. It could be a coworker. Sure. But I think we all need encouragement to be able to feel safe in being ourselves. Yes. And so at some point you decided to, you know, you're in health and fitness. So you're becoming one of those encouragers yes. to other people. Mm -hmm. And when did it shift a little more into like hypnosis? And um, I'm curious about that. Yeah. So I literally came home from that retreat so excited about emotional freedom techniques like my poor husband i sat there on the couch just blah, 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 telling him all about it and um and he was excited for me as much you know as he could be with like what is she talking about you're gonna tap on some stuff and say some things and then you feel better and what is this anyway and he was like go get certified he literally like handed over the debit card he was like can yeah. you just go sign up and just do this thing like obviously this needs to happen and again total number one supporter. And I did the next day I signed up and I didn't just sign up for like level one. I signed up for like the master level certification. And six months after that, I was master level certified in like record time. And I was, I was helping people with that. And, and I was also getting certified in hypnotherapy and things like that. I've had several mm -hmm. different hypnotherapy certifications. And the main thing for me was that at that time I was feeling like health and fitness are great. And I'm, I mean, I still work out darn near every day. I love eating healthy and I love taking care of my body. But I also felt like a lot of the people that I was helping down this path were looking for just like quick fixes or not willing to go deeper and understand why they crave something or what they're feeling as they're doing these things or the deeper stuff that I knew was what was preventing them from connecting with the success that they were looking for in either weight loss or muscle gain or eating healthier. And yeah. so I, I wanted to go deeper myself and I wanted to do it with people who also wanted to go deeper. So I kind of, I didn't let go of the, the health and fitness and nutrition, but I shifted my focus of who I was helping and how I was helping them to more deep inner work and healing. You know, I think it's really interesting that you had the, the feeling of the calling to go deeper, like to play in the deep end. I love to play in the deep end. I'm, I'm a deep end person. And I actually think that, um, we play it safe so often to, uh, because we don't feel safe to be ourselves. And, we get stuck in the, I shouldn't say we, many people get stuck in this surface level connection that is around, uh, having the same conversations about the past and then having conversations about things that don't really matter. And then feeling this emptiness. Mm -hmm. And what I want to say about playing in the deep end is it takes courage and somebody has to go first. And you're probably going to be the only one in your group, or your family, your friend group, whatever that is. Yes. And you're going to be branded a weirdo a little bit. Mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've, <laughs> it will been, trigger the whole, it's not safe to be me thing. Mega. A hundred percent. Probably why I have a very small circle of friends. <laughs> and also <laughs> why I love like the business mentorship that we're both a part of, because it's yeah. a place where I can show up and be authentically me and be received in that way. Yes. To be authentic actually requires us to be leaders. We have to go first in many areas of our lives and that feels unsafe because it feels uncertain. Yes. What would you say to people listening that have like a, you know, they're maybe feeling that call to dive in a little deeper into the deep end of their life a little bit, but they're scared about what other people will think or how their life will look. And what would you say to them about I think it comes down to a taking baby steps. You don't have to go from the shallow end to the deep end in the same, you know, jump or stride and to just meet yourself where you are. I know that especially like in my marriage, for instance, now my marriage with Jeff, I've always kind of felt like I'm the one that goes first. I'm the one that will notice 
hmm, things are a little off this week, or I feel a lot of resistance. And even though we have tried in recent years and we're getting so much better at it. So it's like, there's progress. It's like, hey, we're going to call this out when we see this or feel this, because we both know that this isn't where we want to be. And Mm -hmm. instead of being stubborn and stuck in our egos and whatever else, we're just going to mention, hey, like (laughs) noticing this resistance here, but it's all, it's like 99% of the time it's me that I'll call it out and be frustrated with it. But just in every time that I do that, or in every time that I take a step closer to that thing that's not familiar or that feels a little unsafe or edgy, because it is, it's an edge that I'm meeting, then the edge grows a little bit more. And I normally take a few minutes to do a little bit of my own medicine that I help other people with. I'm very big into like walking my talk and practicing what I preach. So I will take a few minutes and sit down and do some tapping on it and deal with the resistance or the frustration or whatever it is that's bubbling up inside of me that's making it hard for me to reconnect to love and source and that which I am and where I really want to be and instead trying to stay all frustrated and separate and frazzled and and work on it. And And in doing that, I share more of it. And I'm just, I'm blessed to get to see the ripple effect of that. Having four boys, three of whom are still at home. My oldest is a sophomore in college now, but, um, you know, we just had a, a really difficult week. We lost our eldest dog on Sunday. Oh, I'm and, sorry. Um, That's the worst. Yeah, it is. And I'm like in my office now doing this podcast recording with you. And normally where my eyesight can land, there's a chaise lounge where he would always sit. He was like my oh. office mate. So my heart's adjusting this week to not having my office mate. We still have another yellow lab, but he prefers other places in the house. So, you know, just adapting to being a one dog household. But it was beautiful to get to see the way that like my work has affected their ability to be more emotional. And, Mm -hmm. you know, my husband and I were getting ready to work out one morning. We we get up at Odark 30, like 4am every morning and we take a walk and we lift weights together and stuff before he goes to work. And before I start my day and we were getting ready and I was saying to him, I'm like, I'm so, I'm so proud of these boys. My, my oldest came home from college. I called him on Friday and I just said, um, the dog's name was Latke, like a potato pancake. I said, I said, I don't think Latke's doing real well. I said, I don't know how much time we have. I mean, it could be months still. It, it might be hours. I just don't know. I said, something just doesn't feel right. He was at the football game at college and he was home in like an hour. Like he, he was like, I'm, I'm there, mom. And, you know, just to see the way that like he gave up his plans for the entire weekend and just sat with that dog and mm-hmm. just, you know, and just, yeah gave forth to his emotions and everything else. And they all did like all four of those boys just spent time loving on him and expressing themselves. And today we'll get his ashes back and it's my son's birthday. And my son actually just felt really honored that like he gets to share that on his birthday. And the beautiful thing about all of that is, I mean, we, we actually put our, our chocolate lab down last year and my youngest Mm -hmm. son, it was kind of his dog and it was very similar. He took the day off work and my oldest son took the day off work to be with his brothers so that they could, well, we could put them down on the farm here. And, but what I'm, what I really hear underneath all of that is as a parent, I'm certainly imperfect, but what I have noticed is that they don't, kids don't care what you say. They're watching who you're being. Mm -hmm. They don't hear what you're saying. So stop giving advice to your kids and telling them what they should do. When we work on ourselves and we get more free and they see us having the difficult conversations with our partners and emotionally regulating ourselves and and saying, I need help and, and doing those things, that gives them permission to do the same. It normalizes it. And I, I think that often as parents, we, we can get caught up in the trap of you should be doing this, do as I say, not as right. I do. And then wonder why our kids aren't doing what we say. Right. But your boys being in such a lovely space, that's a beautiful example of they're just witnessing who their mom's being and you right. becoming more yourself allows them the freedom to do the same. And I think that's the greatest gift that any parent could give their child is to go and live their life as authentically and beautifully as possible Mm -hmm. and give their kids permission to find their own path. Yeah. It's definitely something that I can feel proud of no matter what else is going on in my life. If things dip in my business or things are, you know, not going well in something outside of the home business or whatever, I always feel good that I'm like, that I'm leading the charge there. And I I know that it means something greater than can even be, be witnessed in the moment. It's, it's huge. So I definitely get diagnosed with ADHD. 
<clears throat> when I was 42. So I'm 46 okay. now. So it hasn't okay. been that many years. Yeah, no, I love this. And I just want to touch on this. So tell me what, what made you go search for that diagnosis? Like Those that were old enough to be diagnosed before I was 42 had already been diagnosed. So uh, we haven't even bothered with my mm -hmm. seven-year-old because it's just, it's there and whatever. Mm -hmm. we're, we have our ways of coping. So I just kind of figured, hey, I my boys have all gone through this. They have all been and, you know, seen the doctors and some have tried medication, some haven't, mm -hmm. and it's worked for some, it hasn't for others. Yeah. And, you know, everybody kind of finds their own path with it. It's like, I wouldn't mind just knowing. Mm -hmm. So that was, I didn't go seeking a whole lot. I pretty much already knew the answer, but it does land differently when you have the actual diagnosis, even mm -hmm. if you know it's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My husband has ADHD and he got diagnosed at, he's 45 and he got diagnosed at, I think, 42 as well. Mm -hmm something like that. And what a game changer it was because I think he actually felt a lot of shame around like the incomplete tasks and feeling overwhelmed all the time. And I remember him coming to me sometimes and being like, ah, he, he would be frantic and overwhelmed about all these things. And I'd be like, I, I'd be just frustrated. Like, well, just get your shit together, make a list. Like, what is your problem? I just could not understand his overwhelm because what seemed so overwhelming to him was like what I'd get done by 6 AM, you know? Yeah. And then he got diagnosed and got some help for that and some support and for him, yeah, some medication, but and all of a sudden he's grounded and creative and, uh, I could see his confidence grow and then something else really unique happened. I didn't realize that there was a part of me that didn't necessarily trust him to be able to fully take care of me or my family hmm. because I saw his overwhelm all the time. And being the female partner in the relationship, that's a natural part of feminine energy to, sure. to need to trust that. And so it was really such a beautiful gift, him getting diagnosed. And we celebrate that because I was able to relax into our relationship even more and feel safe and taken care of. And like, he's got oh, this. Yeah. yeah. So what did it do for your relationship getting diagnosed? I don't know that it really changed anything. Because like I said, we already kind of knew my ways and my patterns and things, and mm -hmm. they haven't changed a heck of a lot. Uh, for me, though, it allowed me to experiment with medication and to realize mm -hmm. that wasn't really what I loved. It was great for like a month or so. And mm -hmm. then I felt like really kind of like edgy and irritable. And I was like, eh, this isn't this isn't where it's at. Back to... Mm -hmm back to trying to just ground myself in other ways and work with my nervous mm -hmm. system and everything else. Um, but it was, it was nice to have that option mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to start learning what does work and what doesn't work. Um, definitely was using way too much caffeine beforehand mm -hmm. <laughs> and hadn't realized how like dialed up that was making me and that I needed to kind of back off of that and cultivate energy in other ways. I naturally am pretty high energy. I'm not somebody that's ever felt like I need caffeine, but I was using it more to focus right. than to energize. Right, yeah. So yeah, but as far as my, my marriage, it didn't really change anything. I think it gave my kids, like our relationship, they were like, oh, okay, mom's got it. We've got it. Definitely didn't come from dad. <laughs> yeah. Normalize it. Yeah. And then yeah. how did, so the other part of my question, I've heard you describe it as a superpower. Say more about that. How is ADHD a superpower for you? Oh my gosh. So many ways, actually just we created a episode that'll be on my podcast in a couple of weeks when it launches all about the superpowers of ADHD. Mm -hmm. But my favorite superpower of ADHD has got to be the hyperfocus. I'm a sucker for a great hyperfocus. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll also say it's really important to be somebody who can um, understand and be intentional about mm -hmm. your life and everything because you don't get to really choose your hyper focus. But mm -hmm. if you're grounded in practices that allow you to be connected with intention and, you know, um, understand like kind of like what needs to happen in a day and things like that to be a little bit more organized, which can be a bit of a struggle sometimes when we have ADHD. But when you're connected in that way, then the hyper focus tends to happen with things that matter instead of like right. going down some rabbit hole on Amazon or yeah, you know, yeah. getting into like a knitting project or something. But, you know, it, you can make it on something that matters. I love hyperfocus. I love the creativity. Mm -hmm. You think about people like Salvador Dali or Walt Disney. They were all like rumored to have had ADHD, immensely creative, so many creative ADHDers out there. And I think that when you know that that can be a superpower, you stop trying to resist all that creativity, that ability to, I mean, we're very 
divergent in our thinking. We often come up with like four solutions to something all at once. <laughs> and, you know, it's, yeah. it's a gift. Um, very creative. I love that. And like I mentioned before, like the, the sensitivity, the empathy, things like that. I see that as definitely a superpower also. So there's, there's a lot of superpowers, I think. And yeah, when we focus, when what we focus on, we create more of, which is the case. I would rather look at the upsides of ADHD all day instead of the downsides, which are evident also. I mean, the impulsivity, the reactivity, um, you know, there's there's definitely higher risk taking that a lot of people with ADHD have. And we can't overlook those things, but I'll focus on the superpowers. I think that we tend to have it. It's one or the other. And, and it's really what you've done is embrace both. We have to be aware of the challenges that will be presented and, and, and be uh, responsible for those. Sure. But then also it, it, it's not, but it's, and, and <laughs> there's these great access to creativity. So you have a book called Becoming More Me, which is your story. And you have a podcast called Becoming More Me, where you explore, I'm assuming, people's pathways to becoming, becoming more, more who they feel called to be in this world is essentially yeah. the idea and including you. You're going to be on my podcast really soon. Yeah. I'm excited about that. Now, where can people find you? Yeah. Well, my favorite social media place to hang out is Instagram okay. at Teresa Lear Levine. Mm -hmm. I have an awesome community on a platform known as school, which is S K O O L. Easiest way to find the community on there is to go to school S K O O L dot com forward slash discovery and just type in my name, Teresa mm -hmm. Lear Levine, and you will see the becoming more me community pop up. I'll also mm -hmm. give you a link for your show notes. It'll be a little more direct for people. And that's, that's the best place because in that community, you're going to get access to over $15,000 worth of free resources in the classroom. I do free weekly coaching in there. And there's a lot of other amazing ADHD entrepreneurs and professionals in there that are all looking to heal and transform and transcend and transmute things together. And it's, it's lovely. So what I'm getting from this, and I want to say this before we, we sign off here is that I just want to share that most high level entrepreneurs that I know really successful people who have forged pathways and made millions of dollars and done things, they would all self-identify as ADHD and as outliers, kind of weirdos, like following their own path. And so I love this conversation today because my hope is that we give some people out there that are listening the idea that, hey, maybe, maybe being different is actually great. Maybe it's a superpower and maybe I'm a leader in, um, creating an authentic life. And in me doing so, I can help make it okay for others. So Absolutely. I love personally that you are out there doing all of that and shining a light, being a lighthouse for others. Uh, and not only being a lighthouse in how you live your life, but then reaching a hand back to help others who have been where you have been and giving them a, a clear pathway. And I really think that that's the future of, of humanity and it is, is in us. Um, recognizing we're all walking this path together yes. and looking to mentors ahead of us, but, but remembering to reach back and help those that are, that are behind us. So yes. I, uh, I really acknowledge we're all walking you. each other home. Yeah. So I really acknowledge you for your, your courage and your, your beautiful journey. And I, I look forward to watching it unfold and, um, and to learning, you know, more about what you do and, and who you are through all of the resources that you provide. I will check you out on school and, uh, Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Oh, it was such a pleasure, Pam. Thank you so much for inviting me. <music>